Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Resilient Health Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Darren Ingalls. And before we get into today's talk, I just want to share a little story. I was reading on the internet, there's a great website, uh, it's called Practical Pain Management. And I just wanted to share a story. It was a woman named Jennifer. She's a 32 year old woman and she was infected with COVID a year ago. And her illness was relatively mild, but she was complaining that she's had chronic exhaustion, chronic fatigue, pain, uh, just was really uh, describes it as, as crippling effects from having a relatively mild illness. And I think in you know, the past two and a half years, we've heard so many cases of people like this that have struggled with these long-term symptoms, even if they had no relatively mild COVID or even other types of viral infections. So, you know, I know it's affected people to the point where sometimes they've had to quit their jobs, they've lost time with their family. So that becomes important because my guest today is Dr. Roger Murphy. Dr. Ro Murphy was with me before we talk about fibromyalgia. We're going to talk a little bit about it again today, and then we'll talk a little bit more about lung health. And if you guys aren't following Dr. Murphy, he is your fibro doctor, an expert in fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. So Dr. Roger, welcome back to the show. Hey, Darren, this is, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me back on the podcast. Great. Well, you know, let's maybe jump in and just talk a little bit about fibro again. You know, maybe talk a little about, you know, what is it? Who gets it? Who's really at risk for this kind of problem? Yeah, I think there's a lot of misinformation mis uh, about fibromyalgia and people really, even today, even though it's been around for 40 something years, actually it's been around for, for uh, decades, but uh, in 1990, the American Board of, of Rheumatology came out with the criteria to be diagnosed with this thing called fibromyalgia. And fibromyalgia is a group of symptoms that people have in common, and we give it a name. Anytime you have a syndrome, the syndrome describes the symptoms. Uh, it's really not the cause of the problem, but right. with fibromyalgia, those symptoms are diffuse, achy, sometimes disabling pain, insomnia, brain fog, fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome. Sometimes they have anxiety and depression, and then they can have a whole list of other conditions that go underneath this banner called fibromyalgia. It affects primarily women, about 97% of those who have women, uh, who have fibromyalgia are women. And the estimates are it's anywhere um, uh, four to 8% of the world population has fibromyalgia. Wow. That's a so, lot of people. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's, it is, but it isn't, it, it, I, you know, uh, you know, you think about type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which is just rampant throughout our, our uh, society. And fibromyalgia is really just a small piece of it, but it's, you know, we're talking millions and millions of people. And you would think by now, uh, 40 years, uh, 30 years, 30 something years ago when they came up with the criteria, that more people would recognize what fibromyalgia is and we would be further along in our ability to be able not only to diagnose it, but effectively to be able to treat it. Unfortunately, as you know very well, um, fibromyalgia is an illness that really is not served by conventional medicine. And, and that's not to step on conventional medicine's toes. Wonderful. You know, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my friends. Uh, but, you know, what where we're at with fibromyalgia in the conventional medical world is that they just tell their patients to learn to live with it. And a lot of physicians won't even take a fibromyalgia patient. Uh, rheumatologists, who are the ones that really came up, as I mentioned earlier, for the criteria to, to have the diagnosis for it to be recognized, most of them now won't accept a new fibromyalgia patient. And, and the reason why, as you, as you know, Derek, is because they found that conventional medicine alone, the common drugs used in conventional medicine is a dead end for fibromyalgia. So unfortunately, they've they've pretty much given up on fibromyalgia and they just tell them to learn to live with it. Yeah, I know. I, I've had the same experience in my practice and I'm almost even hesitant for someone that comes in my office who's been given that label to send them to the rheumatologist or the pain specialist. Because like I said, we kind of know where that goes. It's, you know, it's pain medication, opioids, sometimes muscle relaxants you know, maybe gives a little bit of symptomatic relief, but certainly doesn't get to the root cause of the problem. No, I think, and this sounds kind of silly, but really the only way to overcome fibromyalgia, and you can, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate 
over the last 22 years specializing in it to help thousands of patients to get their life back. But the only way to overcome fibromyalgia is to get healthy. And, and again, that sounds so simple, um, <laughs> but, but as you know, I mean, it's not. I mean, the way that we practice functional medicine is really trying to find the root causes, looking for the underlying causes of these symptoms because uh, fibromyalgia is just a name. It, you know, it doesn't cause this pain. It doesn't cause the low energy or uh, the irritable bowel. It just is a name given to describe these symptoms. And what really has to happen for these folks to get their life back is we have to uncover what are the causes, what are the triggers, and then start to correct those. And that's different for every patient is a little bit different. There's some common causes, uh, but in conventional medicine, as you know, it's all about treating symptoms with prescription medications. And there's certainly a time and a place for that, no doubt. But if you've got, I mean, goodness, I mean, you know, with these folks, if, you, if you're treating every symptom with a drug, I mean, they can be on half a dozen or a dozen drugs. I mean, you know, a drug to put them to sleep, a drug to wake them up, a drug to speed them up, a drug to slow them down. And they get on this medical merry-go-round and it's, you know, oftentimes it's hard to get off of. And oftentimes they don't even know, I'm taking this blue pill in the morning and I'm taking this purple pill at night. They don't even know what they're taking these medications for because they've just kind of gotten lost in the whole medical shuffle. Yeah, we, we call that polypharmacy. <laughs> yeah. And then you start taking another medication to offset the side effects of the first medication. You're right. It, it gets to be a spiral downward that uh, it, it's terribly frustrating for patients. And uh, I find, again, a lot of the medications used do produce a significant number of side effects. I've had plenty of people in the effort to control their pain, help them feel a little bit better. Sometimes the side effects of the medications worse than the condition itself. So, you know, getting to the root cause, of course, is always key. You know, talk a little bit about what you're finding in your experience of, you know, what are some of the common causes of fibromyalgia? Well, I think number one is low serotonin. So this brain chemical, which is the happy hormone, when it's deficient, we see that uh, individuals have a lower pain threshold called allodynia. And in fibromyalgia, they also have a thing called central sensitization pain syndrome, where pain is magnified partly due to their sympathetic nervous system, their stimulating nervous system is, is on hyperdrive. And there's a disconnect between the nervous system and the hormones. So we see a lot of deficiencies in, in different hormones, including serotonin, the brain hormone, uh, adrenal fatigue from low cortisol, DHEA. 70% of the patients that I work with have a problem with their thyroid that's never been properly diagnosed or is not being properly treated. So there's definitely some common denominators with fibromyalgia, but, but Darren, for, for me doing this 22 years, the, the one that really is the, uh, an opportunity to, to make a profound difference is to get that serotonin level up. And a big part of that is getting them going into deep restore to sleep again. These uh, individuals, unfortunately, really struggle with their sleep. And to me, it doesn't matter what your illness is. If you're not getting this deep restored to sleep where the body is having the opportunity to heal itself, to repair itself during the night, it, I mean, you're going to be tired. You're going to, we know that if you're not getting a good night's sleep, you increase your inflammatory chemicals by 40%. Now you take that, you know, that stat and realize, as you know, most everybody that's walking out on the street has inflammation of some kind. Now, they may not have a diagnosis yet, but stress and inflammation, the two drivers of probably every condition out there. And we know that carrying around extra weight or breathing in toxins or eating food that's not quite as healthy as, as we would like uh, creates inflammation. So with fibromyalgia, deep restorative sleep is, if you get that right, you're, you've, you're heading in the right direction. Uh, and you can make a big difference in all the symptoms associated with fibromyalgia just by getting that deep restorative sleep on a consistent basis. I know you and I talked about this in our last interview, you know, talking about, you know, infection also being one of those drivers of fibro. I'm, I'm curious, you know, again, in the era of COVID-19, you know, what have you been seeing with people that have fibro, you know, if they get COVID, uh, have you been finding that it's making everything a lot worse? Uh, has it been really kind of indifferent? I'm curious to hear what your experience has been. 
You know, it's really interesting, Darren, because uh, early on, I really thought that my patients were going to be very vulnerable. And, I, and I'm like you. I mean, I've been training patients for decades now, specializing in fibromyalgia for 22 years. So I've got patients all over the world. I work by, by, um, by Zoom, you know, uh, telemedicine. And my first thought was, oh, my gosh, they're going to be so vulnerable because they're so run down. They don't, like, you know, they don't sleep. They don't, uh, they, they, they're on medications that are probably compromising their immune system. And, but, you know, what I found was for the most part, it didn't matter if they had fibromyalgia or not. It didn't make them more vulnerable. What I saw was um, that many in their family became very sick with COVID, at least early on. And, and uh, I've had patients, spouses who passed away from COVID. But as a whole, my patients have really done very, very well. Now, I can't take credit for that, although I wonder if it's some of the protocols that I share with them early on, preventative protocols that most, I think, have, have um, applied to their daily routine. But now what I have seen is that many of them get the COVID and it's a mild case or they test positive or have any symptoms. But a lot of them are struggling like so many people are with long hauler symptoms and the big one is the brain fog that right. the fatigue and the brain fog those two um and and sometimes it can be hard to separate that from fiber magic because those are two of the two of the big symptoms that we see in fiber magic what we call fibro fog or, or brain fog and fatigue but these are folks that have really been pretty stable been doing well in remission for quite a long period of time that then now they're really starting to see that the fatigue has come back and that brain fog. And the only thing we really can attribute that to is, is the COVID. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just uh, handed a study, uh, our friend, uh, Dr. Suzanne Gazda, who's a functional medicine neurologist in Austin, sent it to me. It's in pre-publication, but what they're finding is that even with very mild COVID, it activates glial cells in the brain, and these are part of your immune system. And it's basically setting off this wildfire in the brain so, you know, a lot of this, you know, brain fog, you know, pain, sensation, neuropathy, uh, demyelination, you know, all of this gets activated, you know, even with relatively mild COVID illness. And I think, you know, we're using COVID as kind of the banner because that's what's in our face the last two and a half years. But the reality is, is that, again, any number of infectious agents, particularly viruses, have this capacity. But uh, I've had a very similar experience that, you know, my chronic Lyme patients, autoimmune patients have all <laughs> flared when they got COVID, whether it was relatively mild or not. But it seems that, you know, at least in part, this glial activation in the brain seems to be a big part of it. Yeah. Brain on fire, right? I mean, that's a term. I mean, that's a, a term that people probably have heard. You're starting to hear more and more about that, whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And now we're seeing that Long hauler syndrome is is this inflammation in the brain. Absolutely. Yeah. And I go back to really, I think deep restorative sleep is one of the most important things you can do to heal up any illness, but in particular, long hauler, because uh, you know, with the brain having an inflammation, the only way the body really can start to repair that is having the ability that that hopefully eight hours of sleep where the brain literally shrinks. And the uh, spinal fluid is washing these toxins out of the brain. I mean, it's really the only time that's happening. So if you're not getting that deep restorative sleep, you're really at a big disadvantage of being able to get over this chronic illness. Well, I want to talk a little bit, you know, we know that with the long COVID, you know, some people are experiencing chronic lung issues, you know, shortness of breath, don't feel like they're getting a deep breath. And I've had some patients who've been to the pulmonologist and they do their whole, you know, spirometry and, and they're, they put the pulse socks on their finger and they're getting oxygen in, but it's that, that, that sensation. And again, I think there's some evidence that there is some mild scarring that can happen in the lungs, but, you know, can we talk a little bit more about not just COVID, but, you know, other types of things that we're seeing uh, with people with these chronic lung issues that I guess, you know, what are some of the warning signs that people might want to look out for if they're having some sort of underlying lung issue that they're not aware of? What, would they, what, would they, what might they experience? I think one of the big ones that I see is this is exertional malice where you, you know, you feel like anytime you're going up a flight of steps or just kind of over um, extending your, you know, physical activity level, uh, whatever that is, 
you just can't get a breath. You just feel like you have this air hunger that happens and the fatigue, I think, are two things that I've seen with my patients who I know have a long hauler. And as you know, um, I'm doing a lung summit that's coming up right around the corner. You're one of the featured interviews. And I put together that summit uh, partly because I'm seeing all these patients with long hauler syndrome thinking, gosh, we're going to have an explosion of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia unless people start to hear what are the protocols for dealing with this. And you you came on so elegantly uh, went over your protocols, how you're helping your patients. Um, but I think, you know, with long hauler, uh, I think we're going to have an explosion of respiratory and lung issues that are going to affect people for probably for, for a lifetime with the scarring that we're seeing in some of these folks. Yeah. And, and I get concerned too, with a lot of these folks too, you know, the, the pollution in our society these days is, you know, terrible. I mean, I live in Southern California. I'm, you know, less than an hour outside of Los Angeles, which, you know, for historically has been one of the more polluted cities in the country, but you know, it's an, it's a global problem of, you know, pollution. And of course out here in California, the last several years, we've had massive forest fires, you know, that very fine ash that gets in the air, which blows for literally hundreds of miles, uh, can, you know, cause this low level inflammation, low level irritation. So, you know, what are your recommendations for people out there, you know, knowing that we've got this sort of global pollution problem, how can we, you know, help best protect our lungs in these situations? Great, great question. And, and, uh, you know, if you, if you think about it, our lungs are the open window to the world. It's kind of like our gut is the open window. Every time we eat, we're bringing the world inside of us and our body has to deal with that. And we're already under assault. I mean, just as you mentioned, just what we're breathing in, the amount of the pollution that we're exposed to on a day-to-day basis. Uh, I remember going to, and in this, I, I forget what year, maybe you would remember this, but when, I, well, maybe not, because unfortunately, it seems like every time we go out to California, there's some kind of uh, calamity going on. But we were out, we were out in Sun Valley a few years ago, uh, and it was so bad. It was kind of the wildfires coming from California that they had days where you couldn't even go out. It wasn't even safe. There, this, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So. Uh, these are the kind of things that people are exposed to, but I think part where it starts is your home. Um, you know, I think pe- people need to realize that their their environment that they're in, you know, day to day home life is where you even start. So having plants. So one of the things that we have on the, the summit, we talk about, you know, what are some of the healthy things you can do at home, and that is just having plants throughout the house. I mean, that helps to filter the air. Using an air purifier, uh, with, you know, there's all kind of different ones out there. I've been using uh, an Austin Air home purifier for probably 15 years. Still, it's still going. Uh, I'll be on the lookout for mold. We, the 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 studies show that 40 percent of buildings in the U.S. Um, I, I think I think I got that stat, stat right have had some type of water damage. So the likelihood that you've been exposed to mold is 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 pretty good. And and so being aware of that. Um, and then I think uh, once you get outdoors, uh, it's a matter really to to take care of yourself through the healthy uh, diet and supplementation, things that you can do that really just kind of help you be in a better position to, to process any of these toxins that you really don't have a lot of uh, uh, option, you know, you're going to breathe it in, unfortunately. So being at optimal health where you can process these chemicals is uh, is the way to go. Well, this is called Resilient Health Radio. And that's the whole point is to make your body more resilient, you know, knowing that we're exposed to so many toxins in our environment, pollutants that the minute you walk out your door, you know, you're not going to have a whole lot of control necessarily of what's blowing out in the air. But because there's such major triggers for so many people, like you're saying, is the healthier you can keep your body, your terrain, the more resilient you are when you do have this exposure, that it doesn't have that same detrimental effect. And as you're talking about indoor, uh, uh, sort of indoor pollution, the one thing I want to mention, because I think it's so important, is please, please stop using Glade plugins. Oh. 
you know, these things are, are, are toxic chemicals. They're often, you know, derivatives of formaldehyde and phenol and some chemical that although it might smell nice are actually very damaging to your lungs and your upper respiratory tract. And, uh, I, I, I just think it's one of the things that people don't realize because they enjoy the odor of it. It's like, if you really feel like you need that in your home, get some sort of natural essential oil product, but uh, please stop using these products. They're potentially very dangerous to your health and certainly your lungs. Well, I noticed that on your podcast, you had Myra Desi in the past. She's the, the uh, toxic guru or food guru or ingredient guru. I think that's what yeah. she did. So she's on the summit and says she did an excellent job on her interview, just talking about all the hidden things in our foods and then also all the hidden things in the the cleaning supplies, the things that we use around the house that we just take for, for granted. And once you start to realize that these chemicals are really pollutants and there's the options, there's all kind of natural options that you can use rather than using um, Windex and bleach and all these kind of things that can be really toxic to our lungs and our bodies. There's all sorts of natural things. And we go and we talk a good bit about some of these things. Uh, and, and, and outgassing. So people don't realize that their furniture and their carpet and these things can be outgassing these potential cancerous chemicals, as well as just toxins that can, uh, that can affect your health. And, um, these are things that I didn't even know about years ago. I, 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 uh, really got interested in environmental health, reading a lot of, um, um, oh, my brain just went. Blind, just like that. I can see the books. Uh, Sherry Rogers. I'm yes. goodness gracious. So uh, all of her work years ago, I mean, it's probably been 10, 15 years ago, that Detoxify or Die was, was kind of a controversial yeah. title. But when you read her material, you realize, oh my gosh, we really are assaulted on a day-to-day -day basis by these things that we're breathing in. And one of the reasons I really wanted to do the, the Lung Summit is because really you don't hear that many people talk about lung health. I mean, I, I, re I wanted to do it because of COVID, because I was seeing this, all this, this um, blow up of chronic fatigue syndrome patients, which are going to be filling up doctor's offices for the next, you know, probably decade, probably at least the next few years. But, but then as I started thinking about that, I thought, golly, when no one's talking really about functional medicine approaches to asthma or COPD or, and really, if you're going to talk about that, then you need to talk about mast cell activation syndrome and histamine dominance. And by the way, for mentioning these things, we also need to talk about food allergies and leaky, leaky lungs. And so it just kind of blew up and it turned into this big, big summit. I really started it off. It's going to be just a bunch of podcast podcast guests. And then as I started talking about this, I thought, wow, no one's really sharing this information. We need to get the information out there that, you know, your lungs are incredibly vital for your health. I mean, you can go days without eating and really you can go days without drinking, but you can't go very long without breathing in air. You know, you're going to get in trouble pretty quick. So uh, I really enjoy doing it. And uh, I think there's just, just a, a wealth of information on the summit that will help anybody that really just wants to be healthy. Yeah, well, I think for anyone who's been struggling with their lungs, you know, whether you have asthma or you don't have asthma, if you've got long COVID, don't have, you know, long COVID, and so many of us have been impacted in our lungs in any number of different ways. If you have a history of pneumonia, if you have a history of bronchitis, if you have a history of just, you know, a toxic exposure, maybe you worked in a job where you had a short-term exposure. Again, any of these situations can create circumstances that your lungs just aren't as optimal as they could be. And again, since so many things that cause problems like infection are respiratory, again, the health of your lungs can dictate about whether you might be susceptible to that infection or not. So you'll definitely want to tune in to, to Roger's uh, summit because he's going to walk you through all these aspects of improving your lung health. Uh, maybe give us a little teaser. Can you give me maybe like, you know, a couple of three things that people can start doing absolutely today that's going to really have a big impact on their lungs? I think really it goes it gets down to basics. And uh, first of all, I, I would really encourage people to eat healthy. And I think people get so jaded to that. I mean, I get jaded to that. I mean, you and I talk about it all the time and just, okay, we're, you know, this is what we do. Our family, you know, we, we eat healthy. That's what we do. We just take it for granted. 
Uh, but all it takes is going in a grocery store and seeing what's in uh, someone's shopping cart. And you think, oh my gosh, people really do eat that or really do drink that. I mean, you're drinking this uh, red colored Kool-Aid or Gatorade or whatever, Powerade that's, you know, it's got these uh, toxins in there, these, these uh, additives and impurities in there. And you see people eating, they're loaded uh, um, the cart up with all these starches and carbohydrates, you know, simple carbohydrates. And they go, oh my gosh, there's no wonder we have a problem with people just saturated with inflammatory chemicals. So the first thing I'd say is really cleaning up your diet. And there's some wonderful diets out there. Um, I'm really a fan of the paleo diet. I think the paleo diet is a great diet to really reduce that insulin sensitivity that really drives inflammation. The keto diet for the right person, I think can be really a game changer. Uh, but, but I think really reducing the amount of seed oils and starches and simple carbs, if you can do that, you're going to be in a better position, uh, no, no matter what your challenge is. So I think that that's number one. And then number two, learning how to breathe. I mean, there's no, I mean, no one really has really probably shared with folks what's a healthy breathing uh, technique, you know, what, how, what, what, what is a healthy breath? So many people are shallow breathers. They're breathing into their mouth instead of their, their nose. And so many people don't really know how to breathe correctly. So in the summit, that's one of the things we have, uh, guests who share, this is how you, you're, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to breathe. And then number three, um, uh, I would say just really doing your best to clean up your home. I think because that's where you're, you're at most of the time. I mean, this is, so if you've got, as you mentioned, the, these plug-in glade, uh, scent, scents, um, you know, these, these things, you got to get those out and really, I think switching to more natural cleaning products, uh, just little things like that can make a big difference. And I really do think Having plants throughout the house. If you came to my house, you'd go, "Wow, I have a lot of plants." <laughs> um, and and uh, I used to fight that for uh, for for years with my wife. Uh, she's the one with the green the green thumb, and uh, and I'd say, "God, this looks like uh, something out of the '60s or '70s." You know, with all these plants, uh, it's kind of fell out of vogue. But she, you know, she's loved them. And now, of course, what I've found out over the over the last uh, several years is how important those plants are filtering the air. Uh, so there's things that you can do that can make really some big differences just for some small changes that you can make at your own. An air purifier. I mean, I think that's money well spent. That's a, an investment that I think most people should uh, have an air purifier in their home and uh, HIPAA filters. I think you should have changing your filter once a month with, the, with these, you know, it costs a little more. I realize that. But really just filtering the air of your house and making sure you're breathing this clean air so that when you do go outside, and I've lived here in Birmingham, Alabama, where we often have days where the, we have warnings for, you know, just the, the smog here in Birmingham, just the way the city is, it's, set, it's in a kind of a little valley and we have a mountain that kind of wraps around it and it kind of just hovers sometimes when we have, when we have you know, cloud cover. Um, you can't really... Do anything about that, but what you can do is make sure that you're set up in a way at your home you're breathing healthy air and that you're taking care of yourself. So when you get exposed to this outdoors, you're able to deal with it and not have any ill repercussions from it. I love it. Simple, easy. Again, these are things that don't cost a lot of money, but can have such a huge impact on the health and certainly the health of your lungs. So again, you guys definitely going to want to check out uh, Dr. Rogers Summit. We'll drop the link in the show notes. As always, a pleasure. Uh, thanks again for joining me. I really appreciate it. Darren, thank you. And, and, and I mentioned you're one of the featured speakers. I want to encourage everybody to make sure you check out that interview, which my brain wasn't so tired. <laughs> my brain's tired today. I'm a little bit not as sharp, but you did such a wonderful job. And I want to encourage people to watch that interview because you gave a wealth of, of clinical pearls. And I think when people tune in to watch that, it will help them not only with lung health, but just to be a healthier uh, individual. And we have, I mean, um, and I don't know if you've had Eric, Dr. Eric uh, Snow on or, or if you, uh, Gordon, Eric, Gordon or uh, Isaac Elias, two uh, just incredible 
uh, researchers and clinicians, but their two interviews like yours, I think are game changers. So I want to encourage folks, make sure you check those interviews out. And Darren, thank you so much for having me on here. All right. Thanks so much.